so we're quarantined here in Paris and all around the world and I feel like this is the perfect time if you are a vintage collector in any sort of way to sit down with your things and enjoy them because I feel like we for the first time in a long time are slowing down may that be at the cost of many things that will disrupt our way of living but I guess we're coming to terms with some of the things we have not cared to look at anyway I finally thought that I would make a video on the perfumes that I collect I've been collecting since six years now today I picked out some of the most iconic perfumes I took a help of a little book perfume bible Parfum de Legend I have no idea what this is in English I mean legendary perfumes and I went through it I've had this book for a long time of course I just picked some of the ones that I have and I just thought I would take you through them and just talk about perfume and the finer things in life and coffee let's start with the one that is closest to my heart and memory and that would be Manteghti by Givenchy. This is the perfume that was created by Hubert de Givenchy for Audrey Hepburn, of course, and that is the reason why it's super close to my heart. This particular perfume stands out from an aesthetical sense as well. My first perfume that I ever collected was Isatis, another legend by Givenchy, and it came in the exact same canister as this one. Here we go, side by side. This is my mom's bottle from the late 80s. That's really how my love of perfume started. I still remember what this smells like and even now when I open this and I smell it and it smells the most prettiest faint smell. That's how I could describe it because this perfume, it explodes. It doesn't spare anyone at all. So Lantigdi was created by Givenchy for Audrey and then when Givenchy started to go public with it Audrey was like, I forbid you and so Antigdi in French is forbidden and so it became the forbidden When I first read about it I thought that oh it would be a very dirty and you know like a skanky perfume but then when I smelled it I was like of course not this perfectly smells like Audrey well Pretty strong. I think I described it in a review that I wrote on my on my blog once upon a time that it's like falling into a bed of powdered powder flowers and strawberry. Today when you think of strawberry gourmand perfumes you think of like very overbearing like those candies which you used to eat when you were young. But this is just it's the most elegant sort of fruity floral that I've ever smelled. It definitely starts off very sharp. As it stays on your skin, the powder becomes more, more evident and it's really the most powdery perfume I've ever, ever, ever smelled. This is, this one is amazing, perfectly describes Audrey as if you were to transform a per person into a perfume. Okay, so off we go with this one. Next, we're going there, we're jumping to the big ones already. Opium, where do we start with this one? A lot of things to say. This beauty is from 1977. I would call it an extinct beauty because the modern incarnation of opium is it's a travesty. This is the pure perfume with its little tassel and the Japanese inspired Inro design and it opens just like this and then you like like take it out and it's just like bottle design at its best at its most extraordinary to get back into opium world my mom once told me that opium is the sort of person which you put on and then you just want to go to sleep it's a drug which just puts you to sleep opium is is a lot of things in one it's rich it's spicy it's sweet it's narcotic it's dark it's it's mysterious it's way too much jammed into one perfume but somehow it all just makes perfect sense this thing will stay I put this thing on the first time I found my miniature and it stayed on my coat for five days and that was the toilet. 
the modern black opium is in no way connected to this guy anyway opium is just very spicy you get um, cinnamon cloves um, and it's like amber very woody of course oak moss is somewhere in there you can I sense rose as well it's just a very very dense perfume and this is one of those perfumes for which they really amped up the concentrations on the eau de toilette and the pure perfume they really went for it and really it was a it created a benchmark for perfumery because from the launch to the design to the overall spirit of the perfume i think we never witnessed perfumery go back to the standards that were set by opium we never saw them go higher than this and i think it it shows um, Yves, Yves Saint Laurent's um, excellence in what he did he created beautiful clothes he created beautiful fragrances the book by michael edwards has some interesting imagery on the creation of the bottle if you're really interested in getting into the nitty-gritty of the legendary perfumes so that's opium for you wonderful rich smoky drugged out opium next i would like to go a few years back Diorella, Christian Dior, created in 1972, I believe, and I would not give up on a chance to put it on. So here we go. Diorella was created by Edmund Rudnitska, who was responsible for most of Dior's influential perfumes. Oh wow, Diorella is, it's, it's one of the best examples of a sheep a sheep being a fragrance which start off very uh, lemony, very sharp, and then it just develops into the most wondrous woody oak moss wonder. Yes, basically. And Diorella is, is the perfect example in vintage form, of course, that demonstrates how, how two things can basically exist in one. This is like hot and cold in one perfume. It starts off with this wonderful bergamot honeysuckle which drives its way right down into oak moss heaven. Diorella is very it's it's sharp, it's fresh, it's it's citrusy and it's it's floral as well. It has a certain sweetness to it. If you've ever smelled a honeysuckle flower, just imagine that being squeezed right between a lemon and a bunch full of oak moss. And it just like heats up on your skin and then you get these cold notes and it all makes a wonderful, wonderful party on your skin. This bottle is amazing as well. They used to make a lot of different versions back then, but this is the splash bottle. It's not the spray, one of which I had and I finished because I love it so much. Diorella was sort of reincarnated again in a perfume which I love, of course, by Frédéric Mal, and that is the Parfum du Thérèse. It's funny because Parfum du Thérèse was created by Edmund for his wife in the 50s. Imagine being a perfumer's partner and just like asking them to create you the most random and beautiful perfumes, which only you get to wear. Anyway, so then the Parfum du Thérèse was commercialized Edmund's recipe with Frederick Mal. It's the perfect summer fragrance I would say. In the winter I really like like thick scents which break the iciness. So I would say that Diorella belongs in the belongs in the summer and springtime. I discovered Diorella not by the perfume itself but when I first look at the wonderful illustrations that Rene Croix did for it. There was a time in in our history when Fashion illustration and perfume were interlinked and you would find these beautiful images, illustrations, and they were for perfumes. Here you have the bottle design. That is the bottle for the, the parfum, which I had my eyes on for a long time, but I guess that's for another day. 
we should travel to the 40s. This is L'Ecre du Temps by Nina Ricci, which translates to roughly the air of the time. This perfume was released after the Second World War when Nina wanted to capture the, the air of the, the post-war madness and how she wanted to return back to romanticism and all things which had basically been cut off from daily life. L'air du temps is a, a beautiful expression, I feel like, of hope and resilience after hard times. The beautiful thing about it is it's not just the perfume itself and how it smells and how beautiful that is, but as well as the presentation. I think this is shared with this guy as well. Opium. Iconic packaging. This is the pure perfume, which comes in this beautiful Lalique designed bottle with two doves at the top who seem to be embracing each other. And the bottle has this lovely swirl design. The box itself is amazing, which was presented like this and opens. And then there's a placeholder for the bottle to like pop in. It's really amazing. So I've put Le Touton on my wrist. This is one of those perfumes which you can describe in one word and I would say it's spicy. It uses cardamom, cloves, and a bunch of others very sophisticatedly. They're all blended with each other, they're all mixed beautifully, and that all lies, I feel like, on a layer of flowers and woods, and of course, oak moss, which binds it all together at the end. I, f I find that Le Souton turns powdery as time goes by, as it sits on your skin. It's a very nostalgic perfume and it's kind of perfect how it makes sense now. How it's nostalgic for good times, better times, happy times after a period of distress. Something which we are going through right now. So who knows, a nice perfume might come out of this. Next, we have Fraca by Robert Piquet. I have it in this big, fabulous splash bottle. And Fekka is really one of those perfumes which screams sophistication. I can picture Rita Hayworth wearing this, or even Jenna Rollins from the 70s. Fekka is a tube rose fragrance. I think it's the best tube rose fragrance that you can get. Mm. Sticky, sweet tube rose and jasmine and gardenia in a in this wonderful resinous it doesn't make you feel crazy it doesn't make you feel like it's too much and you want to get out of it it, it makes you want to like live in the fragrance and breathe it in i think that's the beauty of Hekka and really it it defines this period in perfumery when Hekka and Lech Touton came out and you can imagine of living in a time when perfumery was so sophisticated producing really legends Moving on, let's skip back now a few years. Arpege by L'Opma. The Eau de Toilette. In this wonderful 30s Art Deco bottle. Arpege was released on the heels of the famous trend of El de Heidek perfumes, which Chanel No. 5 started. Arpege is of the same kind, only I feel Arpege is more heady, more strong, more dense, where Chanel No. 5 is more cool, more understated. Just gonna dab it. Mm. For some reason I've always detected a nutmeg-ish note when I smell Arpege. Ilong Ilong and the civet, which really speaks nutmeg to me for some reason. Arpege is, it's very 1927 Parisian chic. It's very aldehydic and then the rest of the base is based on florals. It's very musky. And it has this sort of, like I mentioned earlier, this sort of skanky and dirty feel to it. Like it's a bit overripe. And I think it's perfect for the winter. In those grey frozen days. Moving on. This is by Worth. And it's called Je Reviens, which translates to I'm coming back in this beautiful 
Lalik bottle with stars on it and a tiny golden disc which has the W. From an aesthetical point of view, I've always admired these bottles which Worth produced. They also made these same bottles for their other perfumes, including uh, Dans la Nuit. Je Reviens is it's an interesting perfume. I once read somewhere online that this is a hairspray. I understand why they said that. I put this at the same place where I put Arpege. Okay, it's powdery and it's... Of course you have this spicy effect, but then it's mixed with aldehyde as well. So I get the hairspray reference, but then this is... It's a very wonderful hairspray. It, it reminds me of flowers in a bouquet, like when you go to the florist shop and then they cut things up for you and you can smell the leaves and you can smell a bit of the flowers as well. It's, it's kind of lush, it's not, it's not boom in your face. The sort of feel I get when I smell Vent Vert by Palma, which reminds me of gust of cross and flowers and it's nothing that you can specifically pinpoint and it's a wonderfully mixed perfume. Je Reviens reminds me of that. It's green, it has aldehydes. I would say that this is not a easy perfume to wear. I feel like this smell is, it's you either like it or you don't. I personally, I like it very much. A wonderful piece of perfume history. And the second last on the list, Bala Versailles. This is a potion. This is not a perfume. Bala Versailles was said to be the preferred perfume of Phyllis Taylor and Michael Jackson, and for either one I can see why. I put Bala Versailles on when I want to feel like a king. This is a king's perfume. It's this potion of really heavy musk and leather and amber. You do not want to wear this perfume when you are in your slacks. You want to be dressed up. It's, it's amazing. You can't compare this sort of stuff with what we have today in perfumery. It's amazing, I am speechless. Bala Versailles translates to Paul in Versailles and obviously if you think of the imagery of all the kings and queens and the people in the court, the sort of imagery that is conjured up in your brain, I feel like this is an appropriately named perfume. When you go to a ball, you wear this. This is strong stuff. This reaches the intensity of opium and this will last you days. This is pure perfume, hence the very dark, syrupy color as well. Bala Versailles needs to be checked out if you are a big fan of very heavy, leathery and musky perfumes. The last perfume is Dune by Christian Dior. This was one of the first perfumes which I ever smelled. I had discovered an issue of Vanity Fair from 1992. It for some reason had a lot of perfume testers in it and one of them was Dune by Dior, which was released in 1991. And I remember just putting as much water as I could on the strip every single time I took it out to smell it. it. It was one of those smells which I couldn't really put a name on. Later, I came to find out that that's what they did with Dior. They tried to invent a smell which you couldn't categorize and they would call it ozonic. This is a perfume which you just cannot box into a category. I'm gonna spray some. Mm. It reminds me of the sun for some reason. Sun on a slightly cold day and you can just feel the heat on your skin and it warms up. It's really one of those confusing perfumes which you really love the smell but then when someone asks you what kind of perfume is that and you can't describe it, you can't say it's a floral, you can't say it's woody, you can't say it's green. It's just this, it's a warm perfume, it's floral. I can definitely hint white musk. I would actually call this powdery as well. And it's just like these very light notes which make you feel floaty. Only if you could actually float, that would be nice. All in all, it's a wonderful perfume. This is also a nostalgic perfume, the way it reminds me of the sun and the personal history I have with it as being one of the first perfumes I smell. It takes me back to this time of when you're young and when you're innocent and things seem light and happy. There's this wonderful picture in the book of the perfume itself. As I said, I do have a lot of other perfumes as well, which I could categorize at my own leisure. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it intrigued you and I hope you had fun traveling down memory lane with me and I'll see you next time.